people buy from people. And so this, uh, this mindset that I have of empathy has carried me through my entire career, including working with all of my reps who I think many of whom are quite successful. I have a lot of former reps who are now CROs, they're venture capitalists, they're, they're CEOs, they're retired on boats, uh, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, these are the same people that uh, are nice to their clients and are always seeking to do the right things for them. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Today, I am so delighted to have Mark Finnick. How are you, Mark? I'm great, Wesley. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Let me tell you a bit about Mark. He is a fractional B2B deal coach, and he boosts immediate sales by coaching reps on active must-win deals, freeing up leaders to focus on strategic imperatives and internal processes. His clients report an increase in deal conversion, ACV, and ARR. All right, Mark, tell us how did you become the first fractional deal coach that I've ever met before in my life? How did you start your career and how did you get to where you are today? Sure. Thanks, Wesley. And uh, thanks again for having me. It's a, it's a timely call um, because a lot of uh, uh, software companies are just uh, not attracting the venture money that they need to grow. Um, and uh, we're going to help solve some of that today. So you asked me how I started. Um, it certainly wasn't in sales. As a matter of fact, I had it in my mind to, uh, uh, to be a programmer. I got a bachelor's in computer science a long, long time ago. And um, ironically, in my very, very first interview, they whispered in my ear, you need to be in front of these things, selling them as opposed to using them. So I took that as a compliment and uh, went down the path of selling enterprise software, which I've been doing for the last 40 years. Wow. So you are like me, a technical person, went to school to get a degree in a very technical area, got into the world and said, yeah, nope, I'm not using my degree for that. So as somebody who had a degree in computer science, but you never actually used it in the field, how did those skills that you attained in college help you in your sales career? Yeah, it, it was all about empathy. And I, and I, I speak from the heart, my, my very first sales roles, um, I, I, I put myself in the shoes of my clients and simply asked, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? And, uh, it worked and I gained a reputation for, uh, being an empathetic seller, which leads you to words like trusted advisor. And I've tried to coach my teams to do the same thing throughout my entire career. So tell us what was young Mark, brand new sales person, what was he like? Young Mark had a Sears suit that was reversible, that probably burned and <laughs> or probably melted instead of burned. Um, it was, um, it was, uh, uh, it was a, a very, very interesting time. We all wore suit and ties. I had a briefcase with, you know, the seven habits of highly successful people people poking out of my briefcase everywhere I went and I was going to be there to fake it till I make it. Um, and one thing led to another and uh, started helping clients accomplish what they wanted to accomplish using the technology that my customers were selling. I certainly wasn't, you know, the sharpest knife in the drawer. I certainly wasn't the, uh, the best but I did take it upon myself to focus on what was the client trying to accomplish. If I, if they were clearly able to identify a business problem, we would focus on that. We would pull that thread, but um, it really was about empathy. My, uh, I, I, I come from very, very good stock. My father was the world's greatest salesperson and, uh, and uh, I would watch him in action and uh, I learned quite a bit and I applied a lot of that. What's really fun is the fact that many of the people who were my clients literally 40 years ago are still people who I maintain contact with. Uh, they've been references for me. They've been repeat clients with me. Um, we exchange holiday cards. We exchange, I don't know how or why they do this, but 
right before New Year's. They call me. They should be focusing on their kids, on their family. But we have very, very strong, long, long lasting relationships as a result of uh, me helping them with their upward mobility and in turn, them helping me with my career. Mm, That's so good. So I know, you know, after four decades in a, um, in the workplace, you see a lot of change. So talk us through some of the big changes, the big milestones that you experienced in your career over the past four decades. The biggest change that, um, that I experienced is, um, how organizations grow. I always paid very, very close attention to how um, the executives of my employers planned on growing the company. And I learned at a very, very young age, the meaning of exiting comp- exiting the business, of, of taking a business, growing it, bringing in the liquidity, bringing in equity or investments to actually take the company to something much, much larger. Very simply put, I learned that everything is for sale. Everything is for sale, especially the company. The biggest difference in that um, mindset and in that um, in that uh, uh, trajectory was when I started in the business, the way that we would achieve uh, uh, attract capital was through initial public offerings. And I was very, very fortunate. I've been part of four IPOs and um, four more. Uh, acquisitions. So uh, a multitude of successful exits. The reason I bring this up is, um, uh, you know, around 2000, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, I think it was 2000, maybe a little later, Sarbanes-Oxley emerged as regulatory uh, mandates and uh, required everybody to open the books. It's fascinating how the number of companies who went public, stopped going public and instead started selling their organizations to private equity firms, uh, uh, to other larger organizations. So materially, that's probably the biggest um, uh, change is instead of uh, instead of doing roadshows to Wall Streets, we were always, you know, trying to impress uh, uh, VC firms and, and private equity firms. In terms of technology, I've seen, you know, I, I worked on mainframe technology, and then when mainframe uh, uh, gave way to client server, and then distributed object computing, and then uh, uh, you know the the world has changed, and now we're in a world of of artificial intelligence, and I've become quite proficient in ChatGPT and in Bard, and I'm I'm learning how to use it to complement what I deem to be uniquely human skills. In the sales cycle, there's a role that AI plays, um, but I have uh, yet to hear of enterprise um, negotiating with a chatbot. I have yet to find uh, an app or a GPT that gets a customer to return your phone call. People buy from people. And so this, uh, this mindset that I have of empathy has carried me through my entire career, including working with all of my reps, who I think many of whom are quite successful. I have a lot of former reps who are now CROs, they're venture capitalists, they're, they're CEOs, they're retired on boats, uh, whatever. Um, but uh, you know, these are the same people that uh, are nice to their clients and are always seeking to do the right things for them. So tell us about, you mentioned your reps and you've mentioned empathy a lot and the changes that you've seen um, in the world um, over the past couple couple years, just a few years. Um, and what I want to ask you is how do you take a rep who may be fresh out of school, who may have come from a toxic work environment, and how do you nurture them and help them perform at their best and then go on to see them doing amazing things in the world? Yeah, and it's a re- it's a real timely discussion because so we're, you know, we're a year plus coming out of the pandemic <laughs> where a lot of sellers never had the experience, never had the exposure to uh, face-to-face meetings in their career. They're used to Zoom interactions, and this is this is quite candidly one of the one of the things that was behind me launching Make It Rain, my new company, where I'm doing deal coaching and helping reps on individual deals. 
what I started seeing was a lot of reps were directed to uh, libraries of curated videos that were recorded during the pandemic. Let, let's let's record a video of the features and functions of our technology and you know we'll we'll send it out to a bunch of people and we'll get attention. And that's good. And that will get attention. But what I focus on with my efforts and what I've always focused on is helping sellers empower their clients on how to buy the solutions that will derive that will drive the value that they're looking for. Clients are looking at technology to increase efficiencies. They're looking at technology to uh, disrupt the status quo, but they have relationships with larger vendors. So it's not uncommon for a newer seller to attract attention in an organization. And we're talking larger enterprises. Um, it's not uncommon for them to get attention based on features and functions and um, do a demonstration, respond to an RFI, respond to an RFQ, really establish rapport with their sponsors, um, submit pricing, and then get totally ghosted and not understand why why am I not getting a call back? Well, there's only two reasons that a customer ever needs to talk to a salesperson. That's to get a demonstration or to get a price. And when you give those two and you haven't dem demonstrated any real value in helping the client improve their business, you're going to get ghosted. And this is quite candidly why so many deals are stalling. They're slipping quarter after quarter. Uh, Unfortunately, sales organizations are, you know, forcing or are faced with reduction in force. Um, if you get to a certain size startup, a Series B company, for example, you'll see constant turnover, not only in sales organizations, but in the sales leadership itself. Well, the investors need execution from these startups. So one of three things is going to happen at that stage. If the sellers are not trained to empower their clients on how to buy and how to navigate through the complexities of their organizations, one of three things are going to happen. The CEO is the next person to go. The organization will be flipped to a private equity firm or that organization is going to run out of runway. And this is the, one of the biggest challenges in, in, in the VC community right now. People do want to invest, but they need organizations who will execute. And it really does come down to the sellers learning not only features and functions about the technology that they're selling, but how to empower their clients on how to articulate to higher up in a language that they understand. Not technology, not features and functions, not acronyms, but how do we increase sales? How do we reduce costs? How do we innovate to improve the business? That's the language of the business. So that's what I've always done throughout my career is help the sellers that work with me. I ultimately work for them. So we work with one another and um, that's what they focus on. Those that understand that mindset are wildly successful in their lives. You know, really about getting out of your world, stepping into your prospective buyer, stepping into your customer's world. And, you know, you mentioned like, hey, here's a video on our features, on our benefits. And I, I'm a, a field salesperson, so I didn't have the luxury of, you know, sitting behind a desk and sending emails, videos, doing demos. I had to get out. And so even today, I tell people, I'm like, you got to do some territory planning. You got to get out and see people and ask them questions like, well, why did you buy this? Go talk to your existing customers. Why did you buy this from us? What about us stood out from the competitors and you learn the language of your customers and then you use that for your prospects. And when you can do that, that really helps you develop that true expertise in that subject matter. So spot on, but we're going to, we're going to change that word prospect and we're going to agree not to use that anymore in this conversation or any others. How would you like it if you were a future customer and somebody called you a prospect? That's an off word. So shame on the both of us if we've ever used it. I know that that was a slip of the tongue. Um, you're spot on. You're spot on. And the language of the client, 
is everything right now. Once again, the people who are evaluating technology don't buy it as much as we sell it. So they're always going to have a difficult time translating that into a very, very dynamic set of requirements that if the CEO is evaluating things or the CFO or the board, you know, gone are the days with where vice presidents have significant budgets. Most don't have a budget, you know, more than their monthly salary. So everything has to go higher and higher. There's IT boards, there's security boards, there's technology boards that have to meet. And not only do sellers have to factor in these types of meetings and their sales cycles and, and factor in the time in terms of close dates and such, they have to speak in that language. They have to speak in the language that's going to improve the business or else that money is going to go to another priority. This is particularly important in 2024 when software margins will begin to decline in a very significant manner because there's just going to be more competition. There's just going to be more technology. It's going to cost more to go reach a customer. It's gone are the days you can call, you know, a central location in a customer and find somebody at a desk. It's very hard to find the right people in an organization. So um, software margins are going down. Um, organizations are going to have to figure out more effective ways to engage with clients, demonstrate their unique value, and then ultimately land business in a large enterprise, then through iterative ROI and trust, expand so that they become a top three vendor. That's, that's another thing that I've always strived for throughout my career is always being a top vendor for a client. I love that. I love that being a top vendor, being their their go to resource, their go to authority. And I love to say when I have someone, a client who comes to me and asks me for my recommendation on something that is so outside of my sphere, I know that I've become a trusted advisor. They trust my opinions. They trust the people that I do business with to send it to them. And as a salesperson, as a CEO, if you're an entrepreneur, that is what you want to achieve, that trusted advisor staff. Yeah. And so one of the things I always encourage my reps to do is ask the question early in the relationship. Tell me about your top three vendors. They, everybody knows who they are, and they may not always be the biggest companies. You know, the Microsofts and the IBMs and, and, and the Googles and such, AWS, I, I, I don't mean to ignore anybody or leave anybody out, but all the big guys, they all have relationships. Give you a great example, CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike, from an XDR standpoint, has helped so many organizations stay out of the newspapers for the wrong reasons. One of my former employers, Big Fix, has helped empower IT systems people to do so much more than those that are using other technologies. You know, driving automation, increasing productivity. Um, so it, it, it's a big deal to earn the right to call on a client uh, a, you know, of, of a, a large enterprise. It's game changing when you can say I'm a top three vendor for this particular organization. That's a lot of work. Salesforce has done a magnificent job over the years of earning that status, much to the credit of some really, really top sell. Good. So you call yourself a B2B deal coach. What is a deal coach? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's, there's a movement underway um, that I first learned about last year, known as fractionals. Um, fractional COO, fractional CIO, fractional CTO, they're fractional officers. And the notion is for a fraction of the budget, an organization can hire a very, very experienced executive who, by the way, offers a fraction of their time to multiple organizations. So, so there's this world of fractionals that are out there. Um, when I decided that 
I wanted to be on my own. I wanted to no longer have a boss. I've worked with some and I've learned from some of the greatest sales leaders in my career, but there comes a time where you just, it's, it's my time. So in May of last year, I chose to do this and I reached out to pretty much everybody who I've ever worked for in my career. Um, these are people who are very accomplished in their life. They're the smartest people that I've met. And it was fascinating to hear them describe when I asked them, what do you think my superpower is? What are organizations trying to accomplish that you think I can do better than others? I was fascinated and, and humbled and gratified. I even brought my wife into a couple of these calls to hear how great of a person I was. I was, they're not <laughs> about me. Uh, yeah. They can't <laughs> talk about little of me, but in all candor, they all said the same thing. And they said, Mark, you've been an individual contributor. You were always number one. You've been a global vice president of sales. You were always number one. Your teams were always the top producers, but you know, Mark, and this is my, my former employers and peers and partners and customers telling me, Mark, where you really succeeded the most was when you helped reps go from floundering and getting ghosted and, 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 and struggling to becoming a rainmaker themselves, getting to president's club, helping their clients increase productivity and profitability, showing them things that you didn't know. So instead of being a fractional chief revenue officer and focusing on go-to-market strategies and pricing and, and hiring and sales kickoffs and all the things that are necessary for a sales leader to do, they complement that world by focusing on deals. I work with sellers on individual deals and since I launched the business, I guess we've been very fortunate. I launched the business in May. Um, my first client has already been acquired. Uh, my second client closed their largest deal to date. And then a, a third client, uh, we thought that they were going to be closing business in uh, April or May of 2024. And we brought all that business forward into 2023. So what I'm doing now is what I've done throughout my entire career. I just came up with the term deal coach. And, it, and it's nothing that I invented. There are people doing this. Um, and, and I learned from some of the best. I love it. I love it. A deal coach, a deal coach. So really helping people, reps get out of their head, step into their, their client's brain and bring business forward. So not just closing business, closing it faster, closing it for higher margin, just really helping move people through that sales fund. Yeah. And Wesleyan, it's really fun. This is what I'm really passionate about. And those that know me know this is, I mean, this is what drives me. This is, I, I, I haven't worked a day since I launched this company, I go to camp every day. It's fantastic. I get paid to go to camp. Um, but what's fascinating is watching somebody, and I was on two calls today with individuals, where both of these individuals have been selling a solution for X amount of money. But by helping them transition, helping them pivot their approach to the value that they're delivering to the client, I showed them that it's possible to sell it at a premium price. And oh my goodness, were they afraid to do that? Oh my goodness, were they afraid to ask for this when they've been selling for this? And I, and I explained to both of them, it's two completely different people, different organizations. Um, and I, I said, you can do it because you're delivering this much value. If the value that you're delivering is a billion dollars, and you're charging three for it, shame on you. A customer wants to solve that billion dollar problem. Well, I share this with you because in both situations, they called me, Mark, I did it. Mark, I did it. I asked. Yeah. And we're pursuing. Yeah. And literally, it'll be the largest deals that both of these individuals have ever closed. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, really having that, mm, the, is it the power, the strength, the courage, the confidence really to understand that your price is a direct reflection of the impact, the ROI that you're giving the client. And if you 
take the conversation away from your prize and start moving into the impact and moving into how you really are going to help them achieve their goals, whether it's revenue or it's status or whatever the thing is, then you start winning more. You start winning bigger. You start winning by higher margins, right? And so really helping reps understand that there aren't enough people that are focused on that specific thing. And I think as leaders, it's something that we need to ensure that we're developing within ourselves because that is what the focus should be. And that's how we should be coaching. And behind everything is a why. Why is somebody interested in a demo? Why is somebody interested in buying technology? And it, there's going to be a functional requirement. And I'll give, I'll give you a good example. So many, many years ago, everything in my life is many, many years ago. I used to say a hundred years ago, but now I'm getting too close to reality. So many, many years ago, um, I was uh, demonstrating a piece of technology to a client. And um, they, they explained that they needed to accomplish something. And I, and I said, why? They, well, we have, we have to secure these various things. We have to keep these machines compliant, continuously compliant with, uh, with a vendor or with a client. And it wasn't, it wasn't clicking. So when it came to the break, what I learned was this organization uh, was hit very significantly with ransomware in 2017, uh, a piece of software known as WannaCry, which hit hundreds and hundreds of thousands of computers all over the world. And it, uh, it basically bricked them, right? Manufacturers were not able to use their computers to process orders, products sat in warehouses and couldn't get to distribution centers, let alone the shelves. Well, for this particular client, they were given the mandate by their uh, largest client, their largest client. You need to be comp you need to be fully patched, fully compliant with you know regulatory standards, regulatory mandates within 30 days. And I said, well, that that doesn't sound like that's a big deal. How long does it take you today? Six months. Mm, wow. Half of your revenue. You're a four billion dollar company. So. Wow. Wesleyan, this became a $2 billion problem. I often say the why is equivocates to the biggest business problem, the biggest challenge that your, your client is having. And as, when you understand that, then, you know, it's like, okay, where do I sign? And you take the conversation away from the money that they're having to pay you to solve their problem, to give them their solution. And it's the, the hole, literally, in that case, the hole that they're having to patch, right? So it doesn't matter the cost because it's a $2 billion client, like, or if it's a $20 million client, or even depending on you know how big your uh the cost is it could be a two thousand dollar client and all your other clients are two dollar clients you know what i mean so it, you really have to focus on stepping into that customer's world and asking the why asking the why but also empowering that sponsor to translate the technology they're evaluating into the why because that's what the business executives understand uh, chances are not everybody has access to the CEO, the CFO of a global 2000 company. Those senior executives have people to talk with. So the vendors have to teach the uh, sponsors how to translate this into what's important to the business. And that's largely what I do every single day with my clients. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. You have definitely enlightened me and enlightened my listeners. If people want to reach out to you, what is the one best way? So. I would say LinkedIn, uh, Mark Finnick, M-A-R-K, last name is P-H-I-N-I-C-K. There's a lot of client uh, success videos. There's some success stories. There's uh, there's my story, but I'm here to help. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for selling, sharing your time, your talent, and your expertise with our audience today. It's been a great pleasure to chat with you. Thanks, Wesley. It was a pleasure. And that was another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Remember, in all that you do, transform your sales. Until next time.